So I, I, I've prepared a lot of material over the years for, uh, for that curriculum, which is for graduate composing students. But I also have written a book called Music for Filmmakers, which is for filmmakers. So people who, who aren't composition majors or are not musicians at all, but just how to, how to, um, how to value music and films. And uh, what I thought I would do today is go through the process of what we do. And the process being both on the composition side, uh, not about writing music, but about how that, how that, how composers interact with filmmakers. And also on the song side, the licensing side, which I'm sure as all of, as uh, filmmakers, you're all, you know, interested in, you know, licensing, acquiring music, working with composers, having a soundtrack that is appropriate for your film. So I thought I would just go through the timeline, if you will. Um, and probably the first, unless your film is uh, a music centric, let's say, um, you know, a, a musical biopic of some artist, or I did a film called Mr. Holland's Opus many years ago, which was, I was on the set every day because it was all but three scenes had some sort of music in them. So that's the sort of thing where a composer, a music editor, a music supervisor would get involved at the script stage. Uh, but usually what happens in dramatic narrative, documentary, other than those music centric films, the first instance usually of any music people coming on board uh, is usually a music editor or a music supervisor or both uh, in the early stages of editing in post-production. Uh, and that would be to create temp, temp scores uh, and to maybe to acquire some um, outside music, some existing songs or whatever. And that's, I do a lot of that. Uh, I, because I, I work primarily these days as a music editor. I've worked in the past as a music producer and as also as a music supervisor. But these days I've kind of let the younger folks do the, uh, all the hard work. And I just am a music editor. So what happens is, uh, if you're not aware of it, it's the um, music before a composer is hired is cut into the film or the TV series or whatever it is. And uh, for various reasons, maybe to show a producer or a studio or um, a test audience. Uh, so as my friend Michael Kamen, uh, the late Michael Kamen used to say, never show a full unfinished work. Uh, so you always put uh, music in that's existing music, let's say from another soundtrack or from a record or whatever. So there is something to present. And so it's not just dry. Um, so I do a lot of that. And that, uh, for better or worse, kind of lives with the project for a while. And composers, um, and rightfully so, think it sometimes paints them into a corner because it's established what the music should be before they've had a chance to, you know, weigh in and, 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 and apply their creativity and ideas about how to tell that story musically. Um, after that, uh, the composer comes on board. And uh, usually if it's a re existing relationship with a filmmaker, the composer uh, might be already having ideas about themes and, and uh, various aspects of, of the storytelling of this particular script. Maybe he's read the script, maybe he's been on the set. Um, if, it's a, if it's a first relationship between a director and a composer, then probably there was an early meeting, but there wasn't much exposure to the project other than potentially a script until in post-production when they meet and screen the film and then eventually do a spotting session where all of the director, editor, music editor, composer 
sit down and watch the film and discuss where the music should go in and out, uh, what sort of music it should be, what what the dramatic considerations are, uh, what the uh, if they're if it's thematic to a character or to a place or um, what. what what story is being told? Is there subtext? Um, is there a, a thread that that is creating an arc through the story that, that music can support? Is there an emotion that's not on the screen that wants to come out, in, however so subtly or dynamically in the music? Uh, and then the composer sets about composing the those pieces of music for the film and uh, during that process there are various meetings with the director or producers um, who's ever in charge uh, I like to tell my students the most important thing about a relationship is knowing who can fire you because that's really the person that you need to please uh, the uh, there's depending on geography um, the composer either meets in person with the director or producer and plays music at his or her studio or in their cutting rooms or as often has been the case in the last two or three years over Zoom or whatever this is uh, Google Meet thingy um, and uh, notes are given director says I like that I like that I don't like that I don't like that uh, and gives specific reasons why I had a composer friend who's, who made a very good point about this by the way as young filmmakers hopefully you'll appreciate this said you know when someone says this doesn't work I get offended not outwardly but I just think well it does work. I have a lot of experience doing what I do. And I I wouldn't present it if I didn't think it worked. Now, if you said it doesn't work for me, or I don't like this aspect, or I don't like it, all of those are fine. But to say, no, it doesn't work, is discounting all that has gone into it to this point. And it's, it's really something to keep in mind uh, going forward with relationships with composers and music, and actually anybody quite honestly, any experienced person uh, that you're working with, actors, or writer, or whatever. Anyway, I digress. Uh, the, um, after that process, at the same time as that process, is going, there could certainly also be licensing of songs and, and uh, uh, ideas about how to use existing music and uh, those things start to solidify at, at, during the editing process. Uh, and then if it's a bigger score that requires musicians or an orchestra, then there will be recording dates at some point, scoring dates, as they're called, uh, where that music will be recorded uh, and mixed and then delivered to the final mix or the final dub, as they call it out here. Um, and um, uh, usually, if there's a if it's a big enough project, there'll be a music editor, and that music <coughs> editor will represent that music in the final stages to make sure that its intention, uh, the composer's intention, has been carried forth. And uh, in the final product, it will be as it was intended. It may not be exactly as it was written because lots of things happen between that spotting session and that final dub including changes in the film changes in the director's ideas uh producers weighing in all, all kinds of the editors weighing in all kinds of things can happen to uh, uh require the music to be changed in some manner um and then the final bits of that are a soundtrack album maybe uh or streaming and uh the release and the release uh, from our standpoint involves uh, deliverables, which are just turning over all of the materials through the whole process to the production so that can be included in wherever the film is being sold as a package. You know. 
here's everything. Here's a big box of hard drives. Stick that in your closet. Um, and that's it. That's the, that's the whole music process. Um, the, uh, the licensing aspect, which uh, I'm often asked about, is fairly simple. Uh, if, you're re- if you're wanting to put a recording in your film um, and uh, of the original artist or of an artist recording a song, there's two parts to that. There's what's called a sync license, which is for the underlying copyright, the song itself. And that license has to be uh, quoted from and paid to eventually when the film comes out or when the film is finished to the publishing company, whoever or companies. There could be multiple publishing companies. And those are the people that control the copyright. And so one who's ever representing the music, the music supervisor or a lawyer or whoever will go to that publishing company and ask for a quote. And they'll usually ask, well, what's the film? What's the scene? How is it being used? What's the length of the usage? And once you have a quote from them, then and only then, mainly because they do this a lot more than record companies do, because even if you, if an actor is going to sing a song, for instance, you'll still need that sync license from the publishing company, even though it's not a record. So you don't need a, a license from the record company. So publishing companies is your first stop. They're used to it every day. They've got licensing people who do this, who know approximately what they're going to quote you. Uh, and then once you have that quote, you go to the record company. Let's say if it's um, A&M or Universal or Sony, or, and you go to them and say, or an independent label and say, um, we want to use this song, this recording in the film, and that's called a master use license. And so same questions will be asked, what's it for? Where does it appear in the film? How is it used? How long is it? Um, and then they'll, and then how else do you want to use it? Do you want to use it in advertising? Um, all, all like that. All of those things are part of that or can be part of that license. Uh, is it going to be on a soundtrack? And then there's a negotiation for that soundtrack of, how many points that artist might get and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all of that is nailed down before you can finalize and dub it into the final bit of the film. Uh, without that, without those two permissions granted, you can't use the song. You've got to move on and find something else. Now, does that happen? Yes, sometimes the record company and or the publishing company, but more likely the record company because there's more of a personality associated with an artist than there is of a, of a uh, songwriter. Um, they may say, uh, no, we, because your film is about um, car racing and this artist died in a car crash, we don't want it to be in that film or something. But usually what what prevents songs from being used in films is the price. If you want a Rolling Stones song, it's gonna cost two or $300,000 to license it from the record company. And that may be the your entire budget or it might be the entire budget of your film. You know, so often those dreams of having things like the Rolling Stones or Elton John or Bob Marley or, you know, who knows, whatever can sometimes evaporate mainly because of how much it costs. Then there's other one other caveat that I always like to mention because especially because now there's an Elvis film out, which which I whenever there's an Elvis film out, I'm always curious because the estate of Elvis Presley says that you cannot license any of the songs that he wrote. Now, mind you, he didn't write a lot of the songs that he performed, but the ones that he did, you cannot license if a, a likeness or a, um, um, uh, a, a uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, 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 
impression of him is being made. So if somebody's playing Elvis on the screen, they will not allow you to license one of his songs. So that makes a challenge when you're doing an Elvis because it that eliminates a certain amount of the songs associated with him. There are other artists that are like that as well that have certain caveats built in. Usually they're they're after they've died, but you know sometimes they're you know they could be Christian artists, they could be uh, whatever, just something that says no, I don't want that association. I don't want to be in a violent film. I don't want to be in a um, you know, a film about donkeys. I don't, <laughs> who knows what it is, but it could be something that could catch you out and you go, oh, okay, well, we can't use that song. We'll have to move on. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of the gist of it. Um, and now what I want to know is what do y'all want to know? Because that's way more important than me blathering on for hours on it. Anybody? Does anyone have any questions? Oh, wait, hang on a second. I see. Um, open queue. I'm not very good at this. Sorry, I don't know this one. Um, who raised their hand just now? Okay. And now what do I do? Nalula, just continue. Okay, okay thank you. Say that again. The difference between music composition, soundtrack, and scoring. What's the difference? Oh, yeah. right. Good question. So, the. Let me back up a little bit because movies created in Hollywood anyway have come about by cowboys. You know, these were people initially figuring this out by the seat of their pants. So they just made up terms, right? And that, that tradition has gone on for a very long time. For instance, the, the term cue sheet, you've probably heard. Its original derivation was the piece of paper that came with a silent movie that had musical suggestions of what the piano player or the orchestra or the band should play during the movie. That was the original cue sheet. But now cue sheets mean summary sheets, spotting notes, lists of ADR, uh, dubbing logs. Uh, there's like a dozen things that a cue sheet, uh, the, the final music cue sheet for licensing. All these things are called cue sheets, which is sort of uh, uh, diluted any real meaning and uh, probably something that should be avoided now because, you know, through overuse and misuse, it, there's no more meaning. Soundtrack is kind of uh, similar in that the soundtrack is the soundtrack album, if you will, or CD, where the, 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 there's a commercial release now usually by streaming or itunes or uh whatever although now vinyls had a resurgence so you can buy vinyl as well as soundtracks that's the that's a separate release of the music or a portion of the music from the film or from the tv series the soundtrack is also re used to refer to the overall sound that's attached to the film, which is misleading, as you can see. Um, scoring is uh, the recording of the music, usually by live players. So with an orchestra or a band or individual soloists, that's scoring. Uh, and what was the other one you said? Scoring. Oh, in composition, right. So the, the composer is writing the music to the film, uh, scoring scenes, uh, maybe writing songs, writing themes, and then uh, executing that, these in the modern world, executing that by creating demos 
or mock-ups, if you will, that are, or sometimes the entire composition that's in the box. So it's it's being written and quote unquote recorded more or less at the same time. Uh, and that's what you first hear as a director uh, is that composition. Uh, so that, that then that composition can then be scored if there are live musicians that will be playing on it. If not, it'll just be mixed from a computer uh, without ever having any live instruments. I've, I've rarely worked on a, on a score that was just in the box, though. Most of the stuff that I've done in my 30-some years uh, has uh, has had some some um, musician play on it. May only be a few soloists, or it could be a hundred-piece orchestra, and kind of everything in between. Does that answer your question? Okay, so we have another a couple of questions after the message uh, part, but hey, let me read it to you. Um, Tell us about your way of cutting music as as a music editor, as music editors. Tricks to translate from one music to answer specifically when we edit commercials or other shorts, as a short projects. Music is very crucial to to transit from one emotion to other emotion. So, if there are tricks that you use, I guess tricks to transit from one music to answer to another and tricks from transition <coughs> from one emotion to another through music um, interesting. Uh, well it, it's a it, I've never been asked that question before it, it but it is really important because uh, just like in writing or shooting or acting anything else the, those transitions um, are what are what help forward the story, right? So um, if you have a scene where one thing occurs and then you cut to another scene where something else occurs, um, the, the how you get to that scene is often nearly as important to what happens in those two scenes. Um, especially, uh, there's two, two times when it's really important. But uh, one, when there's a time change, if so, we're going back in time or forward in time, or just a, 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 a time cut where it's just a little bit later, you know, a few minutes later, or a few hours later, or the next day. Uh, it's really important for the audience to understand that that's occurred. Because if, if you don't, then the audience is confused. Um, musically, that can happen in a number of ways. Uh, probably the most powerful tool that we have with music is where it starts and where it stops. Believe it or not, I mean, that's uh, when you see a film or something that has just wall to wall music, where the music never stops, like some cartoons, for instance, um, it really does a disservice to the power of music because that entrance alone or that the stopping of that music is a powerful tool especially in a transition it's the music you cut to the future and that music stops or it starts and that alone whatever that music is tells you that there's a change it tells you that there's a transition um there's uh, you know all all kinds of all manner of of, of musical uh, tools can also be used <coughs> modulations big downbeat change in instrumentation um a sweeping harp uh that that gets you through a dissolve something like that all the things that you it, it, subconsciously anyway uh, understand as that language when you watch it when you watch a film okay i think uh, so Yobi, can you've raised your hand you can ask your question i guess Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, especially when uh, uh, there is a lot of difference between one music and another music we use, uh, there, uh, there is a difference between cues and tempos, 
so uh, when we uh, sometimes when we edit we have to use more than one music so uh, is there any way or any tricks that you can transit from one music to another music uh, uh, seamlessly sure uh, that's um, my question and uh, my second question is what is your way of deciding it is it is this this is the right for my emotion uh, this is good or this is bad thank you okay um so the um let's start with the second one first um the music is very subjective the the, the joke is always uh, uh, people on the film know their job and music too you know because everybody listens to music ever many people play music you know they 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 it, it, it is a language is a universal language that we all understand to a certain extent. Um, determining what works uh, for an emotion has a certain set of criteria that we're all familiar with, right? We know that um, a beautiful string line is usually romantic. You know, we know that dark chords are foreboding. You know, those sorts of cliches, if you will, or tropes or, or common uh, bits of the language are obvious. It's the shades in between uh, where it becomes a little trickier. Sometimes, it, sometimes you never get it. You know, sometimes it's close, but it's not no cigar. It's not quite right. Um, but often it, it, it's all informed by the story, right? And if the music feel, ha, feels like it's the right tempo and it's the right, uh, it's the right character, color, size, um, along with input from everyone involved, as I say, everybody knows music, um, you, you kind of hone it down. Now, when I temp something, for instance, when I put a piece of music against the scene, I will initially offer four or five or maybe six different options that i know are all in the ballpark but they might just be different shades of that same thing but also i may try something completely different and uh knowing that it has some something about it that that still resonates that works uh it's a lot of trial and error quite honest there's no there's no rules fortunately now your other question what was your other question okay my other question is uh what is your way of transiting from one music oh, right. to another yes, music? right yeah. right uh so um weirdly uh i there's there's a lot of scores that cut right together without any problem i know that sounds bizarre but um Obviously, the language is the language, and especially if you're using um, underscores from different films, if they're in the same genre, for instance, uh, they'll use a lot of the same instrumentation and um, uh, and, uh, and chords and keys even. The biggest thing, the biggest tool that I use, other than email, is uh i transpose stuff all the time i use pitch and time and uh you know that's being in the same key or or making a clever modulation is is uh, is is one of the best ways i know to use two relatively disparate pieces of music um also it, it could be that one needs to the the transitions if the tempos are different for instance you may want to find a place where yeah. there's a retard or there's a, a sustain or something that that ceases to establish that tempo and then bring in a new tempo. Um, the same with, with keys. If you wanted to have a modulation, you might want a little break so there's not a clash when they cross, so they don't cross. Um, you know stuff like that and sometimes you have to go find a different piece of music if it's if it's if they're that different um i have sometimes a problem with um older or older pieces of music 
um, you know, things that were recorded 20 or 30 years ago. The quality of the recording could be so different that they are, that they, they stick out one or the other stick out. Um, and that, you know, then you just need to find something that doesn't do that. How I start the process is that I, without looking at the film, I mean, I know the film already, but without trying stuff, I will collect in a folder, a library that I think are scores in a similar vein that will work. And then I choose from those scores, uh, pieces for the temp. And it, if I've done my job correctly, then they're going to be close enough that they can often intercut without you even know it, noticing it. Uh, you'd be, everyone wants to think that their film and their, their music is unique, but the truth is they're not that unique. Um, you know, after you've listened to a couple thousand of them, you realize, you know, that the old adage, there's only 12 notes is very true. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Mm. One more question on the chat. It says, could you name us some movies you love with good music composition? Like Requiem for a Dream. Like I am, what? Okay, I think I'm, I might be reading it wrong. Oh. Uh, Requiem for a Dream. I'm sure you love that. Okay, uh, Abinizer, maybe you would like to ask uh, yourself if I'm not doing you justice in naming the movie. Do I see that chat here? Yeah. Oh, I do. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I saw it. There's some movies we love with good composition, like Requiem for a Dream. I see. Yeah, I'm certainly. Um, the um, one film that I worked on actually uh, that has no score in it whatsoever is one of the most effective musically. I think that I've ever seen, which is Goodfellas. Um, and uh, Marty Scorsese told me when I was working on it that he knew three years before he shot a frame of that film what every one of those songs was going to be. And so they were, you know, they were picked because of their emotion, because of the um, their time period, because of. They were, they were integral to the story uh, in his mind. <clears throat> and so uh, I think that's probably when, when there's a when there's another level of something going on with the music that is not just scoring the scene at hand or even not just scoring the subtext of the scene but something that that sort that trans that tells the story but transcends the individual cues uh, that you know i love elliot goldenthal's music and i've worked on several films with elliot and he I, he does that sometimes to me um we did a film years ago called interview with a vampire not the kind of film i would have generally gone to see uh, but the score was just next level amazing and brought that film to me to another le to a watchable level I'm not a big Anne rice fan so that you know that sort of thing but i was i was riveted to the screen because of that score um what else um I think things that are that take chances are fun. I love this. Um, uh, what was the film recently with? Uh, oh, I forgot the name of it. I like some of Alexander Desplat's scores when they really take chances, like the uh, the hotel one. I thought that was charming and funny and different and and uh and not not ever not hardly anyone would have taken that approach and same with carter burwell some of carter burwell's scores um 
especially earlier ones like Blood Simple um, or Raising. Funny, I asked Carter about Raising Arizona. He said, you never thought I'd bring back yodeling, did you? You know, so those sorts of things that are really, really different, but don't fear so far away from the story that they're not helping bring the film to life. That's what I really love. And there, and the, the, the challenge is, of course, those are chances that the composers have taken or the filmmakers have taken. They are in, in together, they've taken those chances. And that's great. That's a relationship. That sometimes happens when you have like the Coens and, and Carter Burwell, where you have this trust that's built up over many projects. And, you know, they, they end up being amazing. The relationship between Bob Zemeckis and Alan Silvestri. Alan wanted to score the whole first part of um, of the the um, what's it called the you know the film where Tom Hanks is you know, deserted on an island, and and uh, Bob said there shouldn't be any music, and Alan's like no 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 there's got to be a he says no and so. It, it was like role reversal that the director is saying no music and it's usually the composer going, I don't really think you need to score this scene. <coughs> so those sorts of sometimes subtle chances that, you know, the audience probably didn't realize that there wasn't any music in the first 40 minutes of that film. But it was a big chance that they took, especially given our proclivity these days to score every nuance in a film tell us more about music copyright okay um well um <laughs> I, it's, where where do what do you want to know because <laughs> it's a it's a pretty deep subject um I, I don't know where to start really uh Copyrights are uh, life plus 70, uh, and which means that for the life of the composer, the copyright exists, and then 70 years after that. So the estate then owns that music until it goes into the public domain. Uh, that's the basic of copyright. Um, licensing uh, a song, a, a sync license, which is what it's called to license a copyright to use in a film, is done through the publishing company. Usually there's one publishing company that administer, if there's more than one publishing company, there's one publishing company that you go to and they administer that, that copyright on behalf of the other publishing companies. It's usually a major like Warner Chapel or BMG or Sony and or Universal. And so, um, that's the case in, as far as sync for film and TV. Um, on top of that, there's caveats about, uh, no, sorry, not caveats. There are certain times, and I get this often asked when I lecture uh, with documentary filmmakers. There are certain times where uh, something called fair use comes into play where you don't have to secure a license. Uh, let's say that you're using a piece of footage from a rally and there's a song being played at the rally and you can't not use that because there's a speech that's integral to what you're telling that's happening at the same time. And you can't replace that speech because it's, you know, like Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King or something. So you, you've licensed that clip as a whole. The music in that clip does not, by the way, does not usually come, I should say, the 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 uh, license for the music that's attached to a clip usually does not come as part of a package. Uh, you don't, if, so if you're using uh, existing uh, footage that has music in it, you still have to generally get a license for that music separate and apart from the clip. Now, if it's, uh, if it's in context, especially if it's a documentary, uh, then there is a claim for fair use. 
And what that means is that there's no way to use that clip without that piece of music. And it's, uh, it's, it's documentary footage. It, it's real life. It really happened. And you can't really tell your story without using that clip. Then what you do is that you go to a lawyer that specializes in this and they write you a letter that says, I believe that fair use has been employed in the making of this film and hope that that holds up if you ever get sued. That's fair use. Uh, other than that, you'd have to be more specific about what you want to know about copyrights. And then I may or may not be able to answer it. Anybody else? Oh, good. Uh, also, there's a, by the way, there is a plethora of, uh, of, um, of books and materials online about this. All of the performance rights associations, which I should pro probably talk a little bit about, um, are in this country, there are three of them, BMI, ASCAP, and uh, CSEC. There's plenty around the world uh I, I i know that various african countries have have their own performance rights spain italy you know there's a ton in europe they have their own germany canada has two for some reason um <clears throat> which are related what would you say Negro, you froze. It's music is music and sound is sound, you dumb fuck. Oh, we're back. Don't know what happened. Um, I was saying about the uh, performance royalties, uh, which are uh, about when the music is actually performed. And it's not just in film and television, but it's also in like, live performance venues and nightclubs and stuff like that. They all pay monies in to this organizations that then distribute those for the performances. Uh, and they, they, the reason I brought it up is because they all have websites and they have a lot of it, a lot of useful information on those websites. Hmm. Right. Tell us about sound recording equipment. Why is one of them expensive or cheap? How can we protect the sound quality? Um, <laughs> yeah I, why are they so expensive or cheap the, the, I, I don't know <laughs> um, I think mostly it has to do with how many of them they sell you know it's supply and demand for professional gear you know m my speakers for instance are really expensive but you know other stuff isn't so you know go figure I, I just think is how many of them do they sell and also there are certain things that you can't skimp on like speakers like those you know audio monitors are probably the most important piece of gear that any composer or anyone that's in audio owns because that's your window to the world uh, and that's your livelihood if you if you're mixing something or creating something that you think sounds one way and you deliver it uh, to a professional mixing stage, 
and it sounds completely different when you get there, well, then you're, you've, you've failed at your job. Is a sound that engineer can be a music uh, composer? Uh, probably more the other way around. I think a lot of music composers end up being sound engineers uh, mainly because of cost or convenience or whatever. Uh, you, you know, the, you, you, you go down these, you know, you, you're put into situations where you have to do it, uh, even if you don't want to, and, and especially because of the, the time and money. Uh, if you're a nocturnal and you're working at night at three o'clock in the music, three o'clock in the morning, you need to knock out a mix to send to the director the next morning. You're not going to wake up your sound engineer to do that. So by default, often music composers become sound engineers. There are some sound engineers that have become composers, but I think that's pretty rare. Uh, has raised his hand. Okay. Open queue. I don't know what happens when I do that. Okay. Uh, oh, there you are. Uh, Hi. Okay. Uh, my question is: the time uh, we are lost in the process of selection of, from the album that we get from music pro producers. Uh, in our country, most of the time we went to a music score. Uh, uh, we went to a music producer and tell him to making some score and uh, then we gave him a rough cut or a full movie right then he, he gave uh, uh, an album or three or four five musics then mm -hmm. uh, but it can't fit with our movie as we want so what do you recommend when we go to a music producer or is there a good way to communicate with the producers the music producers uh, to make a better emotion in our field? Is there any way you recommend to communicate? Well, um, so I think first of all, um, if you can, if you can find someone who has experience doing film music, that's the, the, fir the, the first best first step. And then the second thing, and even if they don't, I think the most important, let me tell you a story, and maybe this will help. And it was, um, I was producing the music, and I was in San Francisco, the film was dubbing in San Francisco. I finished another film that I was doing early, weird, it was a John Waters film. And I drove over to Skywalker, where they were mixing this other film, just to say hi and see how it was going. And I encountered the director in the hallway as I walked in. He said, I said, oh, how's it going? And he said, well, I like about 50% of the music. And I went, oh, <laughs> and the other 50%? And what he uh, told me was that he didn't, it was Michael Kamen's score. And what he told me was that he didn't feel comfortable communicating with Michael about what he wanted. And I knew Michael could be intimidating. He was a bigger than life guy, but this was an experienced director. He was also a TV producer. I knew him for years. He was an executive producer on a TV show I did years before. I mean, this is an, this guy worked with big actors. He wasn't easily intimidated. And what he admitted to me was that he wasn't a musician and that he couldn't talk in those terms. Now, had it been a first time director, I wouldn't have thought anything of this conversation, but it did take me aback that a director, an experienced director was admitting this. And I said, look, you don't need to talk to him about mu in musical terms. That's his job. Have a good weekend. To translate that. You need to speak to him like you would a, an actor. You would never tell an actor, you would never give an actor a line reading. You wouldn't say, say it like this. Nor do you have to the composer. 
or produce one. And uh, he went, ah, <laughs> he went back and talked to the composer, talked to Michael and got what he wanted. And so I think that's the key is to speak in dramatic terms and emotional terms uh, to anyone that you that's creating music for your film, because that's what you're going to get. That's what you want. At the end of the day, you want to know that it's feel it feel it makes you feel the way that you want to feel. And it's their job to figure out how to do that. <clears throat> now, if it's not fitting. It's if it's about sync, then that's another story that you need to work out the nuts and bolts with them or with an editor or whatever but but as far as the actual content of the music and it matching your film that stick to dramatic terms you'll be way better off have a good week Does that make sense okay thank you anybody else good night how can you protect the sound quality i missed this um well that's an interesting question um and it's one i've been dealing with since i was in college we used to say um because of you know a long time ago when i was in college we were working on 16 millimeter film and the sound for 16 millimeter film, first of all, mag, 16 mag is not very good. And then when you would transfer it to optical, it was even worse. You know, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And wow and flutter and, you know, it was low, low fidelity. But our mantra was no matter how it's going to end up, you will have to try to keep the quality as high as possible to the last moment. You can't just have the attitude that, oh, it's going to end up on 16 millimeter optical. Uh, so I'm not really going to care about how it, you know, what I do now. Um, so I think the answer to that is the way you protect it is that uh, at every step of the way you keep, you maintain it as good as you possibly can and then at some point it's out of your hands i, I did a television show called gallivan which i loved and for some reason abc television let us make it for two seasons if you can see it see it because it's it's a musical half hour musical period in medieval times with music by alan menken and glenn slater songs by alan menken and glenn slater and it's really funny and really, really good, but completely crazy. And how they ever got to make it, I don't know. But we'd worked really hard to make it sound as good as we possibly could. And then when it aired, it sounded terrible. And we ended up going, uh, the mixers and I ended up going to their, to ABC's headquarters of, of where they send this stuff out. Right. The way that it works here is television networks send out their material to their affiliates across the United States and then they download it and then they broadcast it at the appropriate time. So there's a bunch of things that happen. Well, there's one sort of black box thing that happens where they can turn down the left and right channels. And that's what was happening. And it's supposed to be like just set, but if they mess with it, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what was happening. And, uh, you know, we pleaded with them to try to get to these people and tell them not to do that. But there was no, you know, our hands were tied. Which one would you prefer when an image is described by dialogue or just an image? Which one do you like? Yes. <laughs> The answer is both. Uh, there's a time for dialogue, and then there's a time that the pictures tell the story. And there's a time, by the way, when the music tells the story. It's the only element in the film that you can take all the other elements away and still understand. I suppose dialogue to a certain extent, 
but even dialogue falls down sometimes, right? But uh, the music can really tell the story. Um, I, what I don't like uh, is I don't like when a director or an editor fills up the film with dialogue, like adds stuff after the fact, nervous that the audience won't understand the story. And that, I just think that's, that's uh, not giving the audience enough credit. I think audiences are smart. Uh, and and I think, think that an example of that is that I worked on a Chinese film. I've worked on several Chinese films, but I worked on this one Chinese film where it had subtitles. I, I can't speak Mandarin. You know, I was there for three months and I can say three words. But um, what did happen was I knew the story. And sometimes new shots would come in and they wouldn't have the subtitles on it. And we didn't need them. We understood exactly what they were saying. And uh, I, f I thought that was enlightening. To, to me, that was enlightening. To all of us that worked on it who were uh, English speakers, that was enlightening because it meant that this, you know, the story was following a certain way and, and it made sense. Even when they were talking in, in Mandarin, we got it. We know what they were saying or approximately what they were saying. The picture, you know, it was cohesive. It made sense. So I think audiences... I think audiences are, are a lot smarter than a lot of filmmakers give them credit for and don't need to fill up all of it. And it also doesn't leave any room for all the, you know, it's a visual medium. You want room for vistas and, and interesting, colorful shots and racked focuses and, and odd images that you don't know what it is until it, you know, it's, the camera pulls back and it reveals that not what you were thinking at all. And those sorts of, surprise moments you don't get that with dialogue you know unless it's an aha moment where the guy says i murdered your wife you know other than that better just to show him there with the you know with the bloody knife and you go ah he murdered her wife open queue where uh, i'm really sorry guys i'm really terrible at this open queue okay i've opened the queue now what? Alula, continue. Ask your question. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, my question is that uh, regarding with uh, music instruments, uh, for example, when we see Bollywood, they usually use uh, like something like uh, which is a drum, their traditional yeah. music instrument maybe, and uh, when and, and their romantic scenes, we usually listen. Uh, like uh, violin or something like that. So uh, while you are composing uh, music, your mu uh, music uh, for the film, uh, what is your favorite musical music musical instrument? You usually uh, just use as an input uh, while you are doing uh, the film scoring or composition, maybe. I, I'm afraid I don't understand you. Can you say it again? Yeah, yeah. For example, what is your favorite music instrument? You usually uh, use them as an input while you are uh, composing the music. Why do we use certain instruments when composing the music? Yeah. Well, oh, what okay. is your favorite music instrument? Is and why you are it. Why do why do we change yeah. what what musical instruments we use? No, yeah. so he's asking you like what what is your favorite instrument in terms of doing you know in composition or uh, yeah. yeah I guess composition and why do you I use see. that instrument? Your specifically? I, I see. Uh, you mean writing on a piano or something like that? Yeah, or just. Yeah. Or just fi the final um, music. Yeah, the final music. Okay. Well, um, there are certain obvious choices, um, and uh, you know, like strings. Um, 
that that evoke certain emotions, certain qualities. Um, and then there are there are instruments that that uh, represent areas or um, um, time periods. Uh, um, you know, a big band, if you could consider that an instrument, the instruments of a big band, you know, playing swing music are evoke the 30s, right? Um, or a harpsichord would evoke um, the, the um, you know, the people in wigs. Um, and it's funny about that, by the way, the farther away we get in history, the more general we become about the music. Like if we hear a piece of Bach, we don't say, oh, well, that's from 1805 or, you know, um, something that we don't, we don't generally, the, the movie going public is not that specific, the further away we get. But if you're talking about the seventies, and you played the birds, which were in the 60s, people will go, that's not music from the 70s, right? Or vice versa, if you played uh, the Rolling Stones in the 50s, they go, well, the Rolling Stones didn't exist in the 50s, right? So we have, we have a lot of knowledge from a little while ago. And the further you get away from it, the more general it becomes. But the, instrumentation is, is always um it's one of those it's the part of the palette that's that composers um especially uh relish because if you develop a an instrument or a few instruments for uh, a film it gives it a specific character unlike other things you've already done or unlike other films uh that are like it um it it, it it adds uh, a layer that uh, separates it uh, and sometimes raises it ab above where you would be with just the normal um, palette of instruments. So, um, does that answer your question? Yes. Um, yeah, I can. That was a, can I, can you, can I tell you, uh, let me go back over here. Uh, recommendations to be a good music editor for beginners most important skills for a music editor have um well i think that music is uh um a background of music and understanding um uh, drama and, and and storytelling are the two things that are more important than anything um the 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 rest of the technology and uh and those skills they can be developed quite easily. It's that it's that, uh, and and communications is probably uh, the mo most important. Uh, people ask me, well, what's what's your what piece of software do you use? And they're uh, they're expecting me to say something like, well, Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase or something like that. The piece of software that I use more than anything is email. It. it it's about keeping those lines of communication open. And that's what um, solves problems. And that's what makes contributions go smoothly. Uh, and it answers questions. And uh, it lets people know what you're doing, when you're doing it, and relieves stress in a very stressful business. Uh, and then the other part is my second question is, what do you recommend for film editors who work music editing also, what skill they need to add up at least for independent film projects? Well, um, regardless of my colleagues not not being particularly fond of some of the uh, uh, film editors work as music editors, not, not in competition, but within their work as a film editor, uh, it is definitely a skill that I think, uh, especially in, in understanding uh, cutting music, um, not that 
the, uh, the there are many aspects of music editing that have nothing to do with putting two pieces of music together. Um, uh, my, my main job is a technical and creative liaison between the composer and the filmmakers. That's got nothing to do with, with laying up tracks and making edits the work. But that part of it, which is where the film editor needs to, to hone his or her skills, um, it is important to um, just to pay attention and to, to pay, give it some time uh, and ask for help when you can't figure it out. Uh, I know several film editors who are very, very good music editors who cut great temp tracks on their own. I mean, the best temp track I have ever heard was on the first Die Hard. I went to screening. I didn't do it. I, I, uh, they didn't need me to do it. The assistant editor, Derek Brecken, God rest his soul, uh, did it. And it was the, one of the best temps I've ever heard. The film, you could have stripped the film. It was done. It was amazing. And it also, by the way, scored the highest preview scores of any film at 20th Century Fox and still holds that record to this day, 25 years later. Amazing. 30 years later, I suppose. Um, is music universal for you or it depends on the cultures of different countries? Oh, well, I don't know if I completely can answer that. Um, music is definitely universal. And, um, but I can't pretend that I, that I'm well versed in, every culture's music because there are certainly cultural differences and cultural similarities um, that I don't completely know. I mean, there are people who have PhDs in this, uh, but um, from my travels, uh, which I've been fortunate to do quite a lot of, although I have to admit, I've never been to Ethiopia. I have never been to Africa. My wife has, but I am. And uh, I, I would love to to, uh, to to go there and work. I mean, I, I li that's how I like to travel. I like to go places and work because then I find out, you know, what the place is really like and, and the people are like, although people seem to be pretty wonderful everywhere. But um, China, for instance, I learned so much about um, not just instruments and and um, approach to music and all of that but i also learned that a lot of how we were communicating when it came to music was not not uh easy by any means but it was a lot easier than getting a cab or ordering a meal uh, so there are certain, a lot of aspects of music that were quite universal. And now I was heartened to know that. And certainly in, you know, Western Europe or really Eastern Europe, for that matter, it's, uh, it's all very, uh, the, the, the best place to communicate is on the podium because that even the language of music in, in, um, in all the, in, in, and even in Eastern uh, countries, it's all, it's all the same. It's all Italian and German, basically. But uh, as far as the actual music is concerned, it's it's yes, it is universal. But I think there's subtleties and new stuff to learn everywhere in the world. Um, what's interesting, though, is that there are instruments, for instance, that are the same or it's very similar in disparate parts of the world that were developed not by being known to one or the other but developed at the same time and that's pretty wild then there's other instruments that were that were similar like the hammered dulcimer which is called you know different things in different parts of the world but i come from a, a little town in ohio which is near the foothills of the appalachian mountains and those are backward uh, kind of rural communities. And there's a lot of music in those hills. And, um, and those kinds of instruments that are also native to or similarly native to 
Afghanistan and, and the Middle East and, and Africa and some places in the East are like, well, not to lump all the countries of Africa together, but you know what I mean? There's, there are these, these instruments that are very, very similar, yet completely different cultures. So I found that kind of another aspect of the universal nature of music. Boy, that was a long explanation for a short question. What else? And a hush came over the room. I'm trying to see if I've missed anything here. Nope. Anybody else? What I will, uh, what I would like to say is that one of the things that um, I find uh, really important, and we talked about this when I talked about the director not knowing how to talk about the composer, is developing a vocabulary <clears throat> of um, of emotions and drama and and drama, uh, how to talk to a composer or to anyone uh, that it, it is going to supply music because um, it's, very e it's very easy to describe to a costumer what you want usually. You know, this is gonna be a period piece. We want all funny, colorful wigs or, you know, um, everyone should be wearing white all of the time <laughs> you know those are words that you have no matter what language you speak there's words that if the person speaks the same language can understand not so the case so much with music because music is about emotions and it is about a, another way of telling the story and so practicing and honing those words those descriptions, descriptors, uh, is, is I think really Im important and, uh, um, and being thoughtful about what words you use uh, will, will pay off in the, provided that there's a, a, uh, a symbiosis, that there's a relationship, an understanding between the two people, uh, I think you'll find that your collaboration with people creating music will uh, be enriched with be enriched by by honing those communication skills, um, and also maybe as important is letting go of the preconceived notions to a certain extent to give someone else the op opportunity to experiment and try something new and go along with them as a as a uh, as a journey of discovery because you know you might end up coming back around to what you thought it should be in the first place but go around the houses a bit to find out it's worth it and it also it also establishes a stronger bond between <clears throat> your musical person and yourself. Uh, because if you give them um, an ability and a time to experiment, then they trust you uh, to, to play things that they may they maybe wouldn't do with other people. You know, they may be safe, playing it too safe or safe uh, because there's, a, there's many ways to create music for films, many ways, as many ways as there are, compo you know, composers and, and even more than that because each composer has many ways within him or herself to express what it is that you want for your project. So 
I say keep an open mind and develop that language as best you can. Uh, I, I was going to, we don't have enough time today, but one of the things that I like to do, and you can do this on your own, uh, is I like to uh, play a bit of film and then spot it. And it's interesting because you get to express in your own terms how you think the music should be or what you think the music should be. Uh, and that's like a rehearsal for communicating. Uh, so you can, you know, try it on your own. If you're working on a project, you know, start verbalizing how, what you want the music to be, you know, or describing how music works in an existing film that you like. You know, what is it about it? Not just that you like the use of electric guitar or, um, you know, something, some instrument or some melody. But what, what is it about that melody that resonates with you? And how does it resonate with the film? And does it come back? Does it remind you of a certain place? Is it, uh, does it bring out sorrow or happiness or longing? All those things that music has the ability to do. How do you describe that? Because at some point you're going to have to, if you're a filmmaker, and I assume most of you are filmmakers, um, you're going to have to use that language to achieve what you want with the, with your collaborations. Okay, off of my soapbox. Any other questions? It seems like they're all satisfied. <laughs> well, that's good. Okay, now I should have started this. Tell me what, what, who are all of you? Well, this is the part where you all introduce yourself to Mr. Chris. Excellent. Guys, don't be shy. <laughs> Come out. Tell me who you are and what you do. Abenezer, maybe you can start because you've already texted. I make movies. Okay, fabulous. You're the open Scorsese. Wow. Okay. Go on, Io. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a film editor and also uh, some type of generalist in color, sound, uh, when somebody misses. But my main work is film editing. Cool. What do you, um, what do you work on? What, what software do you use? I'll ask you other than email. Uh, uh, mo mostly I use premium, premium Pro, uh -huh. right? And also uh, Da Vinci, Da Vinci Resolve for uh, oh, coloring. Right. Sure. For color and some type of Adobe products like auditions, um, right. After Effects for graphics. Uh, but uh, I mainly work on Da Vinci and Adobe Premiere. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? All right, cool. I have a good friend here who is a, uh, who represents uh, voiceover people. I write screenplays and direct movies. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, good. So I was, uh, I, I, I was, uh, I was, Preaching to the choir, then. Glad to hear it. Mm, yep. <laughs> wow. 
Well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, challenges when the fast paced project. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting too old for too many of the uh, fast paced projects, but um, the great thing about having a load of experience is not having to try everything before you get it right. Um, and so if I have to, I can work very fast and I, and I do sometimes. Um, my problem right now, or my challenge right now has been that I've been working on multiple projects. Uh, and so even if none of them have a fast paced schedule, some of which did, uh, but I have a fast paced schedule because I have to go from one to the other, to the other, to the other, four projects at one point this year, uh, to two points this year. So that's a lot for me. And, uh, so it's about being efficient, getting enough sleep and not getting too stressed about it more than anything. It's about not freaking out. And uh, I think that's probably the key to any uh, thing that, ha that has to go at a fast clip. And also the, the knowledge that it'll be over. You know, the worst thing that I think that you can have or not have when you're working on a film is a release date. Films that don't have release dates may end up paying you a whole bunch of money, but if they go on forever and ever and ever, you just want to quit which i've never done by the way but it, 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 it you we will reach a point where you go okay enough stop next i'm a photographer and also civil engineer wow my grandfather was a civil engineer and he was also a piano player in the silent movies cinematographer and photographer excellent cool my uh I have a neighbor who has a, you would, you would love him. He has a, uh, a cooperative for young filmmakers, cinematographers, and he has a bunch of cameras and lights and, and all of this. And, uh, just to provide them for young people to, to have access to. He's great. He's a, he's the guy that shot the footage. You may not remember this because you're all too young, but, uh, at the, uh, uh, Olympics in Munich, the, the, the film Munich is based on. He shot that footage of the, the hostages being taken. He was the guy. Anyone else? Well, you're a civil engineer too? Wow. That's I guess amazing. we have. I guess we have a lot of multi-talented youngsters with us. I love that. Yep, that's fantastic. I, I'm, I, uh, yeah. The reason that I never became a film composer was because um, I. It's a singular focus for most people, and I just didn't have that. I'm. I'm. Well, you can see I do four projects at once. I'm all over the place. So I'm also a novelist and a playwright uh, and a cookbook author. <laughs> so I'm with you. Not quite civil engineering, but I appreciate uh, the uh, poly maths among you. Great. So if you guys, you don't have any more questions for Mr. Mr. Chris, we have to let him go. This has been a wonderful session. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time. Mike, we have one last question. Okay. There's okay. the last question. Where is the question? On the chat. Okay. Oh, I've On the, the chat. chat. Can you be a DJ? Oh, I, I think I know what you mean. Uh, I joined this session lately. I have a question about sound balance with sound, ear loudly background music dialogue or other sound effects. Tell us about its composition order in sequence. Um, well, I mean, that's a... Um, it 
depends on what's telling the story when more than anything um there's always a give and take between uh the subjectivity of sound uh the way our ears naturally do it if there's a background noise for instance we recognize that that background noise is there and then we concentrate on what we want to hear so we effectively notch it out like my projector is making a noise back there right now and if i think about it it'll annoy me but most of the time i don't notice it uh in a film when you put a backgrounds in for instance it, they're just there our ears don't do that in film it's because of its two-dimensional um aspect i think we're there to absorb it as a whole as an audience member and so for instance background noise establish it call it back so you don't you're not constantly listening to that um music tells the story but sometimes it whispers the story and sometimes it screams the story and music is designed to to do all of those things and the dynamics of new music need to be kept in mind when you're mixing the final mix um and it's it was all it's always my job to say no 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 the composer doesn't intend for this music to be loud they wanted to just just be there just be a part of the texture or no these this tune needs to come out here this is the main theme or this is this character's theme we need to hear that in its whole because it's going to come back and it's going to come back and it's going to come back don't cut it in half or don't turn the second half of it down because then you're you're cheating the audience that experience and it's saying something it's telling the story of that character it's going to develop an arc just like the character developed um, sound effects are really important and sometimes they're not at all important it could be a dripping drop of water that's off screen it's really important but then again if there's a scene where there's a dripping drop of water and you see it but it's really about the, the dialogue between the two characters we don't care how we don't want to hear that dripping drop of water more than just to get it established so it's constantly changing and it's constantly about telling the story and above all it's constantly about what the director wants to hear because it's not a democracy. The filmmaker is calling the shots. If he wants to hear that dropping, dripping drop of water, you can try to convince him not to, but she's going to do whatever it is they want. And that's just how it is at the end of the day. So when you go to a film, realize you're seeing the vision of, uh, of a filmmaker. You know, lots of contributors, but a vision that's generally, usually singular. That answer your question? Awesome. Right. That's, okay. a, that's a good one to go out on. I like that. Okay, great. So thank you, everybody, for joining our session. Thank you. It was, it was my pleasure. I All hope right. to see your films one day. We hope so too. <laughs> Maybe the next one you can come join us here. I would love that. That would be great. Send me the address. So I'll, I'll dial it in. Get on a plane. <laughs> all right. Awesome. I'll send you all the details. Uh, have a good okay. day. Um, we hope to see you soon. We hope we can do this again. I'm sure if we have time. Um, thank you so much. That would be much. great. Have a good day. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.